Hello everyone. Welcome to our YouTube channel Medit, where we are constantly trying to make medical lectures easier for you. And today's video is the continuation of our part 1 tetanus. Today's topics include the signs and symptoms of tetanus, the complications of tetanus, the treatment of tetanus and briefly about the tetanus immunization. So without further ado, let's get started. Do you know the difference between signs and symptoms? Symptom is what the patient experiences and signs is what a clinician observes on examination. So what are the symptoms of tetanus? The most common symptom of tetanus is trismus or locked jaw in which the patient is unable to open his mouth. The other symptoms are pain and stiffness in the neck and back muscles. Rigidity of the abdominal wall, called as abdominal rigidity, anxiousness, restlessness, sweating, headache, delirium, and sleeplessness. Some patients may also experience difficulty in swallowing, which is called as dysphagia in medical terminology, and dyspnea, which means difficulty in breathing. Now, how do you recognize a patient suffering from tetanus? You observe his signs. And when a clinician examines a patient, he is unable to open his mouth due to the spasm of masseter and pterygoid's muscle, which are the muscles of mastication, a condition called as trismus. The next important sign is rhizos sardonicus, also called as smiling face, in which the patient appears as if he is smiling. And it happens due to the spasm of facial muscle, gigomaticus major. The patient is unable to move his neck due to neck rigidity. The reflex activities of the patient is exaggerated and this condition is called as hyperreflexia. For example, you try to examine the knee jerk reflex of the patient and it is usually exaggerated due to the spasm and rigidity of his muscles. Similarly, there are respiratory changes due to laryngeal muscle spasm and which can lead to aspiration of the food particles the voice might become worse and this condition is called as strider and this too happens because of the laryngeal muscle spasm. There are tonic-clonic convulsions as I had already told. Severe episodes of these tonic-clonic convulsions may lead to fracture of bones, joint dislocation and rupture of the tendons. The patient also might present with fever and tachycardia. The patient is unable to pass urine and stool because of the spasm of the urinary sphincter and re rectal sphincters and this leads to retention of the urine and constipation. Since the reflex activities are exaggerated, the stimuli for reflex, for example the light, noise or heat. Okay, so let me give you an example. When you suddenly look at a bright light, your pupils constrict, right? So that's a reflex. Okay, I just want to give you a basic idea that the stimuli like light, noise, heat and so on, they um, lead to a reflex action in our body. And in the case of tetanus, the reflex activities are quite exaggerated. So the symptoms of tetanus are also aggravated in the presence of stimuli like light and noise. And you can observe various postures in a person suffering from tetanus, out of which the most common one is the opistotonus, which means the backward bending, as you can see in the diagram. The other position are orthotonus, which means lying horizontally flat, improstotonus, which means the forward bending of the body, forming a curve like structure and the pleurostotonus which means the lateral bending and all of these is due to the unusual kind of muscle contraction or the muscle spasm and this unusual type of muscle contraction episodes can lead to fracture of bones in the body of the patient. Tetanus itself is a dangerous disease and may manifest with various complications. The most common complication of tetanus is the fracture of bones due to episodes of muscle spasm. Hematoma or abnormal blood pooling in various organs when the arteries are ruptured due to pressure from muscle contraction. There can be aspiration pneumonia, respiratory failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome 
all due to laryngeal muscle spasm. Some patients may present with carditis and arrhythmias, which can be a life-threatening condition. There can be conditions like thrombosis and the dislodgement of the thrombosis leading to pulmonary embolism. There can be toxemia or the presence of toxins in blood. The secondary infection due to toxemia can lead to septicemia which means the presence of bacterial products in blood and this can lead to septic shock and ultimately death. Repeated uncontrollable convulsions in the patients can lead to coma and death. In earlier days when people were quite illiterate and gave birth under septic conditions, mortality used to be very high, up to more than 50%. But nowadays it's reduced to 15 to 20%, but it's still higher in children and elderly patients. The treatment of tetanus includes the general measures and specific measures. The general measures include isolation of the patient in a dark, quiet room. Tetanus is a non-communicable disease and essentially does not require isolation, but since the reflexes can be exaggerated in presence of noise or light, so it's better to isolate the patient. The patient is given 3000 units of anti-tetanus immunoglobulin intramuscularly so as to neutralize the circulating toxins. Similarly, antibiotics like penicillin injection can be given in order to prevent the growth of the bacteria. The patient is given tetanus toxoid immunization 0.5 ml intramuscularly to deltoid muscle and intravenous fluids are also supplied with total parenteral nutrition called as TPN. Since the patient cannot pass stools and urine, urinary catheterization is advised. The patient is unable to open his mouth due to the condition called as trismus and hence nasogastric tube is passed in order for feeding and to prevent aspiration. Aspiration of the food particles can lead to aspiration pneumonia and hence uh, there has to be regular suction of throat to remove the food particles that can lead to aspiration and the patient uh, has to be given nasal oxygen whenever it requires. Since the patient is quite bedridden, uh, the, there can be a condition called as bed sores and it can lead to venous thrombosis. So for the prevention of the deep venous thrombosis, we can use heparin since it is an anticoagulant. The specific measures include the use of benzodiazepine for the control of muscle spasms. So benzodiazepine 20 mg can be given intravenously every 6 hours. Similarly, since there is a tonic clonic convulsions, we can use anticonvulsions such as bifenobarbitone 30 mg every 6 hours given intravenously. The chlorpromazine given intravenous 25 mg 6 hours every 6 hours helps to relieve CNS effects since it is a potent antidepressant drug. Similarly, the patient is give is kept under the ventilator support and endotracheal intubation is done and if there are severe respiratory secretions then we can perform a procedure called as tracheostomy steroid drugs are given for the immunosuppression and since they can be bronchospasms so bronchodilator drugs like dairy filing can also be given wound debridement which means the removal of the foreign body or any dead tissues from the wound Cleaning of the wound and drainage of any abscesses if formed in the wound can be done. So the first thing you do after you get a wound that's much likely to be contaminated is get a tetanus toxoid immunization which is commonly called as a TT vaccine as soon as possible. Now let's talk briefly about the tetanus immunization. Broadly, any immunization can be categorized into two types, the active immunization and a passive immunization. In the name active itself suggests, in active immunization, you are administered actively the antigens or the toxins released by any bacteria or viruses or any harmful microorganisms which can cause infection. So, after given an active immunization, your body responds to the antigen and starts producing antibodies against it by itself.
and hence it's called an active immunization. Similarly, the passive immunization is the one in which you are administered the preformed antibodies against that harmful microorganisms that are capable of causing infection. So you can remember it as in passive immunization you are given preformed antibodies. So P for P, passive for preformed. In the same way, the tetanus immunization is also given as active immunization and passive immunization. Active immunization is generally for the prophylactic or the preventive purpose such that you do not get infected by the tetanus and it's given in routinely in children. The tetanus vaccine can be given as combined vaccine or monovalent vaccine in its active form or in its active immunization forms. The combined vaccine is given to children as I had already told and it's given three doses at an interval of four to eight weeks. The first dose is given at the age of six weeks to the child and after the six week, it means after the four weeks addition or the 10th week or at the 10th week, the children is given a next dose and the third or the final dose is given at a 14th week. So the three doses are at the interval of four weeks, which makes six weeks, 10 and 14 weeks. You just have to add four, 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 okay? And similarly, the monovalent vaccines just comprises of the tetanus toxoid fluid material. So it's not quite important. And let me tell you something else too, that the tetanus vaccine is not given only to children, but it's also given to pregnant women. And talking about the passive immunization, in passive immunization, as I had already told, you are given the antibodies and in this case, the antibody is human tetanus hyperimmunoglobulin. So when are you given this vaccine? For example, you're walking in the street and you just get pricked by an iron nail. So it makes a deep wound, right? And that's most susceptible to cause tetanus infection. So to prevent that, you're given a passive immunization or a passive antibody that goes to your body and reacts against the antigen that has been inoculated by the bacteria, by the Clostridium tetany bacteria. Similarly, there is a next vaccine called as anti tetanus serum or it's also called as equine vaccine which also falls under passive immunization so you just have to remember that there are two broad groups active immunization and passive immunization in the active immunization you're given a combined vaccine that is comprising not tetanus but it also comprises of diphtheria pertussis or whooping cough and tetanus or a dpt vaccine and it's given at an interval of four weeks at sixth week 10th week and 14th week Similarly, in passive immunization, you are given the human tetanus immunoglobulin. And let me tell you that immunoglobulin is also a class of antibody. So yes, that's it about the tetanus immunization. We are nearly at the end of the video and now let's talk briefly about strychnine poisoning which produces symptoms similar to that of tetanus. And hence, it can be placed under differential diagnosis of tetanus. Strychnine poisoning in animals occurs usually by the ingestion of baits that are designed for use against the rodents. For example, the rat poisoning drugs and so on that we usually use in our households. And it produces symptoms that are most commonly presentable in tetanus too. 10 to 20 minutes after the exposure to strychnine, the body's muscles begin to spasm, starting with the head and neck in the form of trismus and rhesus sardonicus. And the spasms then spread to every muscle in the body and produces convulsions. So whenever there is a patient presenting with strychnine poisoning, you might confuse the case with tetanus. But you can differentiate it by taking the history of the patient. Uh, and if the patient complains of any recent wounds and associated with various other symptoms rather than trismus and muscle spasm of the head and neck, then it's likely to be tetanus. 
so yes that's all about it nurse i hope this video was helpful to you all don't forget to smash that like button if you like our videos and subscribe to our youtube channel made it made it made it for you